Hi everybody, welcome to today's webinar, Neuroinflammation and the Gut-Brain Connection, brought to you by Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory and presented by Dr. Daniel Kalish. Welcome Dr. Kalish. Thank you so much, so glad to be here. All right, so today we are talking about neuroinflammation and the gut-brain connection. Very popular topic. This is gonna cover the GI map and how you can integrate the GI map with the omics, otherwise known as organic metabolomics test. So integrating the GI map and the omics, I'll start with the story. For two years, we have been getting these electric bills that are really, really high, like literally five times higher than any utility bill I've gotten. And I've lived in a lot of different houses and a lot of different places. So I'm like, what is going on? And finally, I just decided, okay, I'm gonna end this. So I went around and I unplugged the extra freezer we have in the garage. And I turned off all the air filters that we have running everywhere. And I just, you know, like detected myself to figuring out like, how can I cut this electric bill let down? Like why so many things are running? And that didn't work at all. And then the, when we're two years into this problem, okay? And then about three weeks ago, I hired a plumber to come out because our hot water stopped. And clearly the hot water heater thing, that's all on gas, has nothing to do with the electric bill. Within about a minute, the plumber said, oh, you know, this recirculating pump for your hot water has been on and stuck on. This is, this is going 24 hours a day. Have you guys had huge electric bills? And I was like, yes. And I had to hire a plumber to figure that out. The point of the story is, if you're an electrician and you're looking at electrical problems and it's coming from another system, like your plumbing recirculating plumb, who would think it was a water-related problem? You're gonna have an issue. So if you have a brain issue, okay, and it's coming from your plumbing, from your gut, who's gonna figure that out? Nobody, because all the brain-related doctoring people don't think that depression, anxiety, mental health problems, memory issues, fatigue, those kinds of things could come from a gut problem, okay? And just like this plumber figured out my electrical problem in like less than a minute, you're gonna be able to immediately figure out a lot of brain-related issues if you run a GI map. It's that profound. And it's gonna seem easy to you because you're gonna go, oh, I just ran this GI map. You've got Giardia, Giardia gone, brain problem solved. But to the patient, it's like a revelatory and amazing experience. So if you start to explore this gut-brain connection, you will have cases like this in your clinic every week. I can guarantee you absolutely that'll happen. And that's what happens to everybody that does this. And in our mentorship program, you know, we train hundreds of doctors a year. There's no way that can't happen. That has to happen. That's the only outcome of you learning how to integrate these two tools together. So if you start to understand how gut inflammation and gut commensal bacteria and cytokine production all impact your brain health, that's really the goal here. Why the lab testing is critical, you cannot figure any of this stuff out with lab work, without lab work. It, it, you couldn't even begin to figure it out without lab work. You're not gonna look at someone and say, oh, I think your quinolinic acid looks really high, but I think your kynurinic acid is low. I mean, there's no way you could even conceptualize how to do this without labs. And the heart and soul of the class, again, the core of this and the core of functional medicine to so many degrees is the concept that the gut is the source of many health problems, including problems with the brain. That's what we're gonna get into. So now, if you're looking at this from the gut perspective first, and then we'll look at the brain perspective, and then we'll look at some cases to tie these things together. What do you look for on the GI map? The, is there a problem with the microbiome? This to me is the first phase of the first stage of the disruption of the gut. There's a problem with the microbiome. Low short chain fatty acids, that'll be seen on the labs when you see the bacteria in the commensal lab section that make fatty acids, short chain fatty acids are low. You're gonna see commensal bacterial imbalance and that's on the normal bacterial section of the test. So if those markers are skewed low, you can be pretty sure that short chain fatty acid production, the main one's called butyrate, is gonna be low. And that's gonna be a big problem. Butyrate, which is made by these good bacteria, travels to the brain you, you couldn't make this up if you wanted to. It's like a sci-fi movie. I'm gonna say this again. You're, you eat food, your bacteria feed on that food. They digest the fiber, and from the fiber, they spit out fat. 
Go figure. That's what these bacteria can do. They spit out these fats. They're fatty acids, but they're fat, short-chain fatty acids. The main one's called butyrate. That butyrate does all kinds of amazing anti-inflammatory and immune-enhancing things in your gut. It's super important for your gut. But another thing that that butyrate does is it goes to your brain, and when the butyrate hits your brain, it acts as a stimulant. It's like a growth factor for brain cells. Can you believe that? So the gut bacteria, the good ones in your gut, stimulate through butyrate the growth of your brain. That's how crazy this stuff gets. If you think I just made that up after this talk is over, take some notes down and read about it. Butyrate, it, it stimulates brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, in the brain. In other words, if you heal the gut, you're going to heal the brain. Stage two, GI organs are impacted. So now the microbiome screwed up. Now what else could possibly happen? Well, you could have inadequate hydrochloric acid, inadequate digestive enzymes, inadequate bile coming from the gallbladder. Your gut could be leaky. You could have a degradation and a wearing out of the immune response. That gut lining can wear down. Have you ever had a pair of like running shoes? And you know you're supposed to change your running shoes like every six months or a year or something, but they're like three-year-old shoes and the heels are just kind of worn down and you can't even see the little waffle thing anymore. They're just worn out. You're like, I better throw these away. That happens to the gut lining, that beautiful mucosal layer of the gut lining and all those villi and microvilli sticking up. They actually are worn down. And when that happens, your secretory IgA starts to go down and all kinds of things happen. So if the GI organs are impacted, we're worried about the stomach making hydrochloric acid, the pancreas making enzymes, the gallbladder making bile, the gut lining being damaged or degraded or worn down, like your heel of your shoes can get worn down, which is going to wear down something that is measured on the GI map called secretory IgA. And if you see secretory or SIG-A, secretory IgA low, then you know that the immune system has been worn down and that's not a good thing. In fact, I, I should mention that these are related. The damage and destruction and, and uh, weakening of the microbiome is going to feed into the GI organs being impacted. I mean, there's overlap between these categories. The third thing that happens if the Sig A is low and the commensal bacteria are low, then you can start to have problems with GI infections. And this is one of the things that is arguably the most fun part of the GI map, if you could say that the GI map is fun, and I would say it's fun for, from my perspective. I really enjoy the GI map. Um, I mean, it's fun like seeing a really great piece of artwork is fun. It's not like ha-ha fun, right? But it's fun. It's like, wow, this is exciting. This is cool. I can't believe I can see what's going on in this person's gut. So if the microbiome is screwed up, and the organs are starting to not work like they should, then the immune system is weakened, and then infections either are acquired or old infections that have been monitored and dealt with start to pop up and become symptomatic. We had a global experience these last three years with a virus that has, in fact, stimulated the growth and overwhelming, you know, worsening of many GI infections called COVID-19, right? So one of the consequences of COVID-19 in long haul COVID patients is that they end up with dysbiosis, they end up with old infections that were fine, they were like a little bit of giardia, it wasn't causing a problem, flaring up and being problematic because of the effect of COVID on the gut. So this is a big problem worldwide now, even more than ever, gut infections. People that had low level gut infections are now finding that they're getting quite a bit worse. So a weakening of the microbiome and a weakening of the organ systems allow these infections to get going. Pre-existing infections can flare up, especially with something like long-haul COVID, but it happens in other cases as well. But you can also just get a new infection if you're stressed out enough and your immune system is weak enough. And the GI map looks for these as well. So the GI map has sections that analyze for the microbiome, it has an organ section they're called digestive health and it has a section that looks for sections that look for gi pathogens quite extensive sections on gi pathogens so the markers of dysbiosis and infection 
are pretty clear, and we'll look at some examples in a few minutes. Um, they look for bacteria, parasites, worms, yeast, all the different kinds of bugs. Right? Now, with the stage one, or the microbiome-related problem solution category, if you see the microbiome is displaced and the markers, especially if they're you know skewed towards being low, if the markers are skewed towards being high, it's kind of a separate question. But if the markers on the microbiome portion of the test, the commensal bacteria portion of the set test are skewed low, then you're thinking about lifestyle changes like eating fermented foods, eating higher fiber foods, having beans every day. It doesn't have to be super complicated. You can get all the fiber you need for your microbiome just from eating a half a cup of beans every day. It's not a particularly expensive or complex solution, but most people don't eat enough fiber. That's an easy way to do it. You can also supplement, and I always supplement if I see these problems for the short term while the person's making their lifestyle changes. So the supplements are prebiotics, probiotics, and you can get some good quality butyrate as well. You have to be careful with butyrate. Make sure you source it from the right companies. It's only two or three companies that sell butyrate that's any good. But prebiotics, probiotics, and butyrate are the are the supplements that you can use to get the microbiome back online. And of course, there's a big emphasis on diet as well. And then for the organ function issues, we're thinking about chewing your food properly, not drinking tons of water when you're eating, breathing, so and relaxing and doing something that's, you know, when we were in, um, when we were in uh, Italy a long time ago, I just had this memory, and I I'm probably making this up, but I'm pretty sure it happened. I was on a bike ride, and um, we, came, we, we had lunch at this place, and it was just like this quint – it was like something right out of a Hollywood movie. But it's this long table. It's out looking over a vineyard, and all this wonderful food is just displayed, and we're just having lunch. And to me, it was like this peak experience, and to all these Italians – it was like lunch, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just how they live their lives. And so a lot of the digestive problems that people have have to do with the quality of food, but just also the way that we eat. People don't chew very thoroughly. People are not paying attention to their food. They're stressed. They're reading the paper. They're checking their phone. They're doing something else. So the lifestyle factor for organ function is really just to get people to eat properly and slow down. The supplement side you have betaine HCL, digestive enzymes, GI repair powders, gallbladder support. There's a whole variety of supplements you can use to support organ function extremely effectively. And then on the um, stage three or the you know pathogen side, we just like to kill things. Um, you usually will put someone on a gluten-free diet while we're doing the killing. This makes things go a little more smoothly. Maybe a FODMAP diet, something like that. But really, we want to go after whatever bug it is with herbal antiparasitics, herbal anti-yeast products. Oftentimes we end up using prescriptions, uh, different kinds of antibiotic uh, prescriptions or antifungal prescriptions, depending on the patient and the circumstances. But it's an aggressive phase of treatment, but often necessary for people. But important to realize that the reason why the pathogens are a problem, the reason why the pathogens are a problem is because of the microbiome and organ disturbances. It's usually not the other way around. In other words, usually the microbiome gets thrown off, the organs aren't working well, the immune system is weak, and then the infections become a problem. It's unusual for it to work the other way, although it can, meaning it could be that your microbiome's in great shape, your organs are all working perfectly, and then you pick up an infection. That does happen, but not that often. It usually works the other way. So then when you're thinking about the roles of gut bacteria, you can't even really wrap your mind around this, other than to say it's like, uh, it's just unreal. But here's an example of a commensal or good bacteria directly impacting a regulatory T cell. And it's not like the gut bacteria are involved in the process. They're directing and controlling the process. So the gut bacteria regulate your immune system inside your body directly. As I just mentioned, the gut bacteria directly impact your brain and your brain health. It's pretty profound. So if your microbiome is in good shape, many of these problems that we're talking about 
are going to be non-existent. So here you can see, I don't know what that color is, it's kind of like a salmon-y pink color, but that's representing the mucosal layer. It's supposed to be really thick. If you eat a lot of fiber, the good bacteria and your own body work together and you have a thick mucosal layer there, which you need to buffer and protect your body. If you look at the fiber-free diet image, you can see the little pink or salmon-y colored thing is like shrunk way, way, way down. That's leaky gut. That's a lack of the mucosal barrier. So you don't have all that protection that you really should have. And you've got an overgrowth of bad bacteria on a poor diet, or it's what we call dysbiosis. So I, like, I have this new thing. I like, I like to phrase labs to lifestyle. I don't know why. It seems a little silly now that I say it publicly, but I, I use it anyways. So labs to lifestyle means, hey, we're doing this lab, but one of the main things we're going to get out of this test is to tell the patient what the lifestyle changes they should make are. So that we're not doing the labs for lab sakes, for the labs for their own sake, you know, which I would do because I really like the labs. We're doing the labs for the patient's sake. And so we're doing the labs, using the lab data as a motivational tool to get people to do the things that they know they should do, but they're not doing. Everybody knows that they should eat more dietary fiber. Every single human being in America knows that they should eat more fruit and more vegetables. Everybody knows you're supposed to eat fruit and vegetables primarily and every meal, but people just don't do it. So when you see on these tests, there's markers that help you know, give you evidence that they're not doing that, then you can use that and have the patient be motivated by the fact that their labs are screwed up. So if you have low short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, that's the commensal bacteria, then you prescribe, quote unquote, more dietary fiber. If you see low polyphenol markers, and those are markers that are on the omics test in the digestive metabolite section, polyphenol, so this is an omics marker section here, low polyphenol markers means they need more polyphenols, which are from fruits and vegetables. Now, I just think this is kind of interesting, and I'd like to use these explanations with patients just to motivate them. So, we can all do this exercise. I do this exercise a lot. I did it this morning. What happens when you stop breathing? You take a deep breath in, you breathe all the way out, and then hold your breath out for you know a minute or two. It becomes very clear very quickly that breathing is an essential function for our brain and our heart. Eventually, you, you would just die if you were like underwater and you couldn't breathe or something. So the way that your microbiome works is that it's in this self-contained system in your large intestine. There's no oxygen in there. It's anaerobic. Okay, but there's hydrogen. There's just not a lot of oxygen. So when you eat fiber, the short-chain fatty acid producers in the gut, the good bacteria would die without the fiber. That's why when you run these labs, you see commensal bacteria low. It's because the person's not eating enough fiber. That's why the bacteria have died off. The, in a normal situation though, if you're needing an, eating enough fiber and you're making these short chain fatty acid producers, you're also gonna be making other bacteria, or you're gonna also be uh, you know, stimulating the growth of other bacteria that make hydrogen. These hydrogen producing bacteria, they're gonna die off if you don't have the short chain fatty acid ones. And guess what? There's another group of bacteria that consume the hydrogen that the other bacteria make. And if you don't have the hydrogen producing bacteria, then the hydrogen consuming bacteria die. So in other words, if you eat, if you eat fiber and it's working properly, you make the short chain fatty acid producers make their stuff, the hydrogen producers make their hydrogen, the hydrogen consumers get their hydrogen, and all these bacteria are happy. But if you cut out the fiber, or if you cut out the polyphenols, then this whole sort of ecosystem of how one bacterial group is feeding on another's byproducts completely falls apart. It's just like, I don't know, in wildlife biology, if you what is it that, I don't know, if you kill all the bugs in a stream and the fish are eating the bugs and the fish start to die, it's like that kind of a thing. Or if you kill all the deer in an area, then the wolves don't have anything to kill and then the wolves start to die, something like that, right? But it's in your gut. You need all these different kinds of bacteria. So we want to make an effort to improve commensal bacteria and improve the commensal bacterial markers on the test. That's a goal. You see those markers low? 
you want to put them on the right program, retest in three to six months, and those markers should come up. Job done. You want to improve the status of the hydrogen producers and the hydrogen consumers, both. The hydrogen producers, again, we're right back to fiber. You need that. And um, here's a, a variety of different options that you can use. So you can use uh, regular fiber, you can use things like chicory, you can use beans, you can even use fruits and veggies, get the fiber from there, right? You don't have to do all this with supplements. Um, I like to use supplements because I find it just speeds things up, you know? And so there's different companies, they have both prebiotic supplements, obviously you have probiotic supplements, and every, every company that we work with, you know, sells different kinds of fiber. Those are all things that are easy to get your hands on. So now, in terms of the basic support for the commensal bacterial markers, you want to identify when soluble fiber is essential, which will be, I'll give you a hint, it's, it's pretty much 100% of the time, okay? You can also identify when polyphenols are essential. So there's polyphenol markers on the omics test. And if you look at the uh, um, digestive metabolite section of the omics test, and you see those markers are very low, it means that the person needs polyphenols to stimulate the good bacteria. So again, this is a good example of how you can see gut-related problems showing up on both tests. Um, there's also a special organism, and there's a few of these organisms that you just kind of need to memorize. Uh, it's the one that repairs and renews the gut lining. This is a good bacteria by living on the mucin in the gut lining. It's called Acromantia mucinophila. Okay, Acromantia. A lot of people just call it Acromantia. Mucin, phila is lover, right? So it loves mucin. That's its food supply. It's like a lawnmower fertilizer for your mucosal barrier, right? It chews it up, but it nurtures the gut lining and the mucosal layer of the gut lining. It'll start to grow out in response to berberine. Now, here's a list of some of these bacteria. And you don't have to really memorize any of this stuff because you're going to end up doing the same thing with everybody. If the markers are low, just use fiber and polyphenols. But this is just kind of interesting to know. These are the ones that respond to soluble fiber and polyphenols that are in really large numbers. Okay. And the high abundance just means that there's a lot of them. And so they're pretty important because a lot of them. Now, again, here's the same exact thing, but in a diagram. You eat the dietary fiber, you make uh, the bacteria make the short chain fatty acids that stimulates the butyrate, good for your brain, good for your immune system and your gut. Then the hydrogen producing bacteria start to grow out. The hydrogen consumers live on the hydrogen that the hydrogen producers made. So now they're starting to grow out. And then there's this big happy circle that we're in. If you don't have the fiber, all of this falls apart. The short chain fatty acid people are not around. The hydrogen producers collapse. The hydrogen consumers don't have anything to eat because the hydrogen producers are gone. And so then ding, 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 this whole chain of life completely falls apart. Fiber in the diet or fiber in supplements and polyphenols will stimulate the system to start to work properly. And the polyphenols, you guys all know, um, blueberries, cranberries, I really like pomegranate. You can get it in juice, but you can buy a lot of these things either dried or fresh. Uh, it's not that hard. I mean, I eat these these foods every day pretty much, polyphenol-rich foods. Once you get into it, it's not that hard. You have to, have to buy them and keep them in the house. They're they're kind of expensive, but it's you know you're worth it <laughs> basically. So polyphenols are molecularly large structures. Strangely enough, polyphenols are big. And so you don't pull them across your intestinal lining into your bloodstream very well at all. The polyphenols stay in the gut and they are fed upon by the commensal bacteria. This was a news flash to me. I mean, all those years when I was broke, I used to ride my bike to the farmer's market and I'd be there with my bike and the saddlebags and I'd be looking at the, you know, the pint of organic blueberries 
And it was always like 10 bucks or $15. I was just thinking, oh man, I just don't even have that much money. And I would just lay down the money and talk to the farmer and grab my blueberries and go home. I always thought I was doing that for myself. I had no idea. I was eating those blueberries to feed the commensal bacteria. But it turns out that those commensal bacteria in turn heal your brain. They tell your immune system what to do, like we just saw. This is not like a, I'm just being nice to my commensal bacteria kind of thing. It's like they're taking care of us. We need to take care of them. You got to eat the polyphenols and the fiber to make that work. I definitely highly recommend supplementing with polyphenols and fiber in the beginning until people get used to the diet stuff and then they're kind of off and running on their own. Okay. Here's a research article if you're kind of curious about this kind of stuff. You could look this one up later. Just snap a quick picture of that maybe. You can read about this in more detail if you want. Okay, so this is a thing. I just you just really can't believe this happens that your body, you know, these bacteria can turn fiber into fats. That's just so trippy. Gives you some appreciation for how complex they are. These bacteria aren't just sitting around, you know, loafing. They're really kind of looking after us as much as we're looking after and we should be looking after them. Okay. So then there's um we talked about this a lot, the metabolism of fibers. We don't have to go over that. Now there's also hydrogen producing bacteria. There's a list of them if you're really curious about it. Um, some of these are tested on the GI map, but they're the ones that are making hydrogen. And then there's the question as like, why do bacteria make hydrogen? Isn't that a little strange that there's so many of these guys that do that? Well, in humans, as I was saying earlier, we breathe oxygen because that's how we make our ATP or energy. And you wouldn't live for very long if you weren't breathing. I don't know, a few minutes, but you know, not like an hour. Bacteria produce hydrogen, but they're doing it in an environment where there's no oxygen. So they can't go through the normal kind of steps that we would think about as a human would with, with oxygen. So the way that they deal with the extra hydrogen that's left over, they can't cram it onto a water molecule and get rid of it. They have to cram it onto another hydrogen. So they end up forming hydrogen gas, okay? And they end up forming butyrate. But again, these things are very good and very important for us. The hydrogen gas is then used by this other group of commensal bacteria as a fuel supply. And then the butyrate, as we talked a lot about, goes to your brain. So there's this perfect circle of life going on in your gut. You can initiate the entire process by eating fiber and polyphenols with every meal every day. And if patients aren't doing that and they're a little messed up, then give them fiber products and polyphenol products for three months or six months to kickstart this process so they can start to get back on track. As the microbiome falls apart and these bacterial populations start to not do so well, your immune system fades, your mucosal lining starts to get screwed up, your beta rate starts to drop. Now you've got a brain problem, a leaky gut problem, now you've got an immune regulatory problem. Now you've got H. pylori because your immune system is shot and this whole kind of cascade of bad things happens, starting with the microbiome, then the organs starting to get a little wonky, and then the infections starting to become a problem. So we treat all three. We treat the microbiome with probiotics, prebiotics, and butyrate. We treat the organs, depending on which organ is messed up, leaky gut repair, gallbladder support, uh, pancreatic enzyme support, these things will show up on the labs. You can see it on the testing. You'd be like, oh, you have a steatocrit problem. I'm going to give you gallbladder support. Oh, your elastase is off. I'm going to give you digestive enzymes, right? So you don't have to guess about what your solutions are. You can see, oh, this is an organ issue. Your pancreatic enzymes are low. That's an organ problem. We better fix that organ issue, okay? Or gallbladder support if the statocrit is off, or if the leaky gut markers on the test, the SIGA and zonulin and those kinds of things are off, then you're going to start to repair the gut and improve the immune system in the gut lining. So the lab will tell you which organ system is messed up and how you want to treat it. The lab will tell you if the commensal bacteria are low, and then the lab will tell you if the um, infections are present or not, okay? So that's kind of phase one, gut. Now we're going to get into phase two, which is metabolomics. So what is metabolomics? Metabolomics is the large-scale study of small molecules. 
large, I think this is kind of funny, this way, large scale study of small molecules commonly known as metabolites within cells, fluids, tissues, and organisms. Collectively, these small molecules and their interaction within a biological system are known as the metabolome. So metabolites, which is what we're measuring, these small molecules together are the metabolome. Just like genes taken together are the genome, or proteins taken together are the proteome. Okay, and so we have these different terms, genes, genomics, uh, proteins, proteomics, metabolite, metabolomics. The study of these small molecules. Many, if not most of these small molecules that we talk about on the omics test are gleaned from organic acids. They are organic acids. Why do we call them organic acids? Because they're acids. Um, that was a joke. That wasn't really even a joke. It was just kind of like funny to think about it. But I, I, you know, you don't really think about it that way, but they're acids. That's why they're called organic acids, because we're looking at addict acids. But their metabolites would be the bigger section, metabolomics. That's what we're looking at. Don't let the big words fool you. Like when I was first learning this stuff, I was like proteomics, genomics, metabolomics. Ew, it's like, ah, but don't let it trip you up. It's just pro think of it, the top line is easier. Metabolomics, oh, it's the study of metabolites. You know what a metabolite is? It's something that's being broken down. Proteomics, what's that? Oh, it's the study of proteins, <laughs> okay. Genomics, it's just a study of genes. So if you take the omics out of it and you go up to the top of the diagram here, it's like, oh, I'm studying metabolites. Hmm, I'm studying genes. I'm studying the uh, proteins, keep it simple. And in fact, what we're looking at on this test, if you wanna get into the detail of it to a certain extent, is that it's the genes that express in a certain way that build or create proteins that then determine the metabolites. So genomics determines proteomics, determines metabolomics. See, when I use the omics thing, it's really confusing. You didn't understand that. But if I just say, oh, well, your genes code for proteins, like enzymes, and the proteins in your body that run all your metabolism are gonna control the metabolites, which are the breakdown products. So genes build proteins. The protein's job is to generate metabolites. That's the byproduct of, what, of the protein. That's, that's the same thing as saying genomics goes to proteomics and metabolomics. Now, in specifically, we are supposed to be talking about just one really important part of this, which is the neuroinflammatory part. And that has to do with these chemicals, or I'm sorry, these metabolites, now that we know the word metabolites, the metabolome as it relates to the neuroinflammasome, or whatever the term is there, I just made that one up, is uh, looking at uh, how cytokines are released and produced. Okay, it turns out that when the body's inflamed, we make a lot of cytokines. And we make those cytokines from an amino acid called tryptophan. I'm not saying that this is good or bad. I'm not trying to judge here. I, well, and I, I am. I'm saying this is a bad system. We make cytokines from tryptophan. I'll just come out and say it. It's a bad system. Whoever designed this was just stupid. It was just poorly designed. It's like the very front of my car. I bought this 15-year-old sports car recently. In the very front of it, just it rubs on everything. Every time I go over any curb anywhere, it, says, <laughs> it scrapes. It's just a bad design. So many, could have redesigned that. This is like a flaw because cytokines are released in response to inflammation and infections. And in fact, one of the things that happened with COVID, right, was people were dying from this cytokine storm. This can get out of control. It'd be life-threatening. You make your cytokines from tryptophan. It's a design flaw because you also are making serotonin from tryptophan too. So if you have a lot of need for making cytokines, your serotonin levels drop. And that's the kind of intersection between gut inflammation, gut infections, could be viral infections too, it doesn't have to be in the gut, it could be COVID. That's the intersection between infections and the brain, is that we make these cytokines out of tryptophan. So the more cytokines you're making to fight an infection, 
the less serotonin you have. And as you know, when serotonin levels drop, people can't sleep, they get depressed, they get anxious, their mood is really disturbed, throws people off. There's this whole other section over here on the tyrosine side where we're making the catecholamines, and that's sort of a different story. It's also related because it's an integrated system, but I think it's easier to learn it if we just talk about the tryptophan part. So the neurotransmitter imbalances can come about for different reasons. You could have a deficiency. Uh, we're not really talking about that so much, except for absorption. So you, maybe if your gut screwed up and you're not absorbing well, you may just have a deficiency due to a gut problem. That's easy because if you fix the gut problem, the deficiency goes away and they'll be better right away. But you could also have damaged neurons. Now there's some kind of a toxin or there's some kind of physical trauma that's damaged the neuron. Or really what we're focusing on now is not only a toxin, but some kind of an infection, something that's driving neuron damage, something that's driving depletion of um, tryptophan and serotonin because it's driving cytokine production. Okay. Toxins damage this other system um, we're kind of thinking more, I think it's easier, well, I could teach it after, but now that I said it, I kind of got to say both. Okay, so the, with toxins, you're usually going to see a pattern of environmental toxin exposure impacting the dopamine system. It's complicated, but there's reasons why that happens. With infections, it's more often that you see it affecting the tryptophan and serotonin side. Okay, so that's the damage that can occur. And then, of course, there's genetic variables that we're not really talking about. So the way that patients experience this, they're tired, they crave alcohol, they crave food, they have anxiety, they can't sleep, they have pain, they're inflamed everywhere, their memory's bad, all these different kinds of symptoms. And again, here's an article, you can snap a picture of that if you like to read stuff, I think this one's particularly good, talking about inflammation and the brain. Another article about kynurinate or kynurinic acid and um, you can just read the title, it kind of says it all. The kynurinin pathway as a therapeutic target in cognitive and neurodegenerative disorders. This is what we're measuring. We're measuring that pathway. British Journal of Pharmacology. It's a mainstream idea. That's the whole point of that article. So here you go. We're going to try to tie this together. If you're inflamed, you just got COVID, you have long haul COVID, you have H. pylori, you have dysbiosis, you have a bad yeast overgrowth. It doesn't matter the source of the inflammation. The body has this response where it's gonna crank up inflammatory, it's gonna crank up cytokines, and here's the pathway here, and that's gonna lower the amount of tryptophan. On the labs, you're gonna see quinolinic acid, and kynurinic acid go up. So we're measuring all this. You can measure tryptophan, you can measure kynurinic acid, you can measure quinolinic acid. How cool is that? You can measure neuroinflammation on an omics test. It's worth the price of that lab just for these two markers. Wouldn't you want to know if your brain was inflamed? Isn't everybody a little worried about Alzheimer's? Have you seen the Planet of the Apes movie? I just rewatched it, uh, the first one, not the one with Charlton Heston. If you're old enough to remember the one from, with Charlton Heston from the 60s, then you're really too old. <laughs> but the, the newer one that had James Franco in it, and James Franco's dad, he's played by John Lithgow, was one of my favorite actors. And his dad, John Lithgow, uh, Franco's dad, James Franco's dad, has Alzheimer's, and his memory is completely gone. If you haven't seen the film yet, I'm going to ruin it for you. And so, but James Franco is a bioscientist in San Francisco, and he discovers this compound that generates brain cells, and he jabs it into his dad's arm, and his dad becomes normal for like a little while, but then it goes bad after that. His dad doesn't turn into an ape, but the apes get a hold of this compound, and uh, it's not a good scene. Now, the reason why this is super important you don't want your brain inflamed. Tryptophan is kind of at the center of this. And we all think of tryptophan as being just like this, I don't know, it's like we typecast it into just being this like precursor to serotonin and melatonin, but it's not. It's a lot more than that. In fact, I, just you got to look this up just for fun. There's a journal of international tryptophan research. The fact that someone even started this journal, I find amusing. But in the journal, 
what journal? The Journal of International Journal of Tryptophan Research. It's not the local journal, it's the International Journal of Tryptophan Research. Here you go. Protein synthesis, right out of that journal. The principal role of tryptophan, the principal role of tryptophan in the human body is protein synthesis. And then the second paragraph here, there's your kynurenine. After protein synthesis, the second most prevalent metabolic pathway of tryptophan is for the synthesis of kynurenine, which accounts for approximately 90% of your tryptophan, kynurenine. And then here's our metabolite word again. Kynurenine is a key component in the synthesis of a number of metabolites. But most importantly, it's the precursor of kynanuric, kynanuric, I said that wrong, and quinolinic acids. Each of these metabolites has the potential to affect other neurotransmitters. Dot, 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 dot. That's basically this diagram right here. And we're measuring quinolinic acid and kynanuric acid and tryptophan. So tryptophan is responsible for protein synthesis. It's involved in this kynurenine pathway. And then the third thing on this list is that it's related to serotonin. Okay. So here you've got your tryptophan. Remember, 90% of it is going towards this one thing that you didn't even really know about until about 30 seconds ago. 90% of it's going towards uh the kynurenine pathway. That's the whole cytokine production thing. That's the pathway that gets screwed up when you have COVID. That's the pathway that screwed up, gets screwed up when you have digestive tract infections. Okay, and here's another schematic of tryptophan going to serotonin at the top there, tryptophan going to body proteins, tryptophan doing all this stuff. So here's another breakdown of it. Real quick, let's see here. So here's our tryptophan. The first and most important thing it does is protein synthesis, makes proteins, including antibodies, any kind of protein in the body requires tryptophan. The second most important thing is it goes down this kynurenine pathway to kynurenate or kynurenic acid and to quinolinate, also known as quinolinic acid. So this is the inflammatory pathway. You see here it says product of inflammation product of inflammation. This is the inflammation stuff. And of course, the more tryptophan you use to deal with creating quinolinic acid and kynurenic acid, the less tryptophan you have available to make serotonin. So people get depressed when this process is happening. They don't feel very good. So we'll start off with a GI map. Oh, this is just brutal. Well, we could spend an hour just on this one. But anyways, let's just summarize it and say, this person has digestive tract infections, C. diff, toxins A and B, salmonella, a little smidgen of H. pylori, the microbiome's a little wonky, it's actually kind of on the high side, dysbiosis markers, don't look very good. Uh, is that enough? Yeah, that's it. Okay. So. Perhaps let's just look at this from a more global perspective since we don't have hours and hours. Let's just say that it's obvious that there's pathogens because you can see all these red marks are pathogens. But let's look at the microbiome itself. Now in this case, the microbiome, there's one marker that's low, but a preponderance of these markers are actually high. What does that mean? So if those markers are high, it can be a normal healthy response. It also can be uh, like an overgrowth of commensal bacteria. It's not really dysbiosis, but it's kind of a feature of the gut not being in great shape. Let's just say that. And then if you go down here to this lower section, and the person obviously has dysbiosis, but this lower section here, I just want to show you the, the markers for uh, organ systems. So steatocrate is a marker for gallbladder. Elastase is a marker for pancreas. And this whole section here are the markers for uh, and this section too, actually, both these sections are the markers for uh, the intestinal tract. So again, you can see what's going on with the gut, organs, as well as with the microbiome and the pathogens. 
So this just summarizes that this person has inflammation. You can see all these inflammatory markers are up and immune markers are up and a bunch of pathogens. Inflammation and a bunch of pathogens together in the gut. And so now let's look at their related omics test. And what did we just spend the last few minutes talking about is here, tryptophan. So tryptophan levels will drop if there's enough inflammation for long enough and the cytokine production goes high enough. Some of these other pathways that we're talking about, like kynurenine, will start to go up or down, depending on how long the problem's been going on, again, in response to the inflammation. So you can see, and we have to put the pieces together. If you see depleted tryptophan and the neuroinflammatory markers are either up or down in some dramatic fashion, it typically means that there's inflammation coming from somewhere. You look at the gut markers, and if the gut markers match, then you're starting to suspect that that might be the source of the problem. I'm going to show you one other set of markers here. These are really important. So again, this is going to show up under the uh, tryptophan metabolism page. And remember, we saw those pathways. You can see now why they put this under tryptophan metabolism, because it's tryptophan metabolism. Remember? Kynurenic acid and quinolinic acid. Remember, they were further down on that tryptophan pathway. I can show that again if you guys need to see that. Those markers being high means there's neuroinflammation. 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 What do you do about that? You look at the gut markers and you treat them, and you start to bring down the neuroinflammatory markers by working on the gut. And that's basically the gut-brain connection in a nutshell. There's many, many other ways that you can look at it, but this is an easy, clear way that you can see this problem happening. So let's just remember, kynurenic acid and quinolinic acid, you got those? Those are neuroinflammatory markers. Okay, and let me just show you one more time the pathway. There we go. So why is that under tryptophan metabolism? Because tryptophan, gets broken down into kynurenine, kynurenate, uh, and quinolinate, or quinolinic acid. You have to get used to this, because sometimes you'll see research articles that will say it's quinol quinolinic acid, and some will call it quinolinate, it's the same thing. Kynurenic acid or kynurenate, they're the same thing. So if these markers are high, it's neuroinflammation. It's coming from tryptophan. There's your cytokine storm. All right, so I'm going to design a program, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So we want to, and I'll just do this generically. You want to treat the GI infections. In this case, with that particular case, I don't know, you could just pick and choose. I'd probably go after the dysbiosis markers first and then the C. diff later. So you've got a couple of GI infections you can treat with herbs. Not too many people use antibiotics for dysbiosis, you're kind of stuck using herbs. So you want to do a good herbal program to clear that out. And then you want to get something to calm down that uh, quinolinic acid if the quinolinic acid is high. Usually people use magnesium for that. I didn't show you that pathway, but that's an important thing here. Typically, magnesium glycinate is usually a good form. You can use other forms of magnesium if you want. And then you want some kind of anti-inflammatory. You could use something like a curcumin type product. That's good. A couple of those, depending on the strength, you know, let's say one or two of those with each meal. And that would be, oh, and then depending on the other aspects of the lab, you can use some tryptophan. Now, is tryptophan going to make this situation worse? Well, not really. They're deficient in tryptophan. It's not tryptophan availability that's a problem. It's the inflammation that's a problem. So if you're reducing the inflammation, you can give them the tryptophan. If you did nothing for their gut and you gave them a ton of tryptophan, I don't know what would happen. I've never done that. I could easily see that screwing somebody up. Just don't do that. <laughs> Do the gut test. You can't 
treat tryptophan problems without doing the gut test. It's insane. It's there's just there's no reason why she sh you, sh you would do that. It's it's dangerous. You don't want to do that. So I because I, I hear all the time, but can you give tryptophan to somebody if their quinolinic acid is high? Isn't it going to make them worse? No, it's not going to make them worse because the first thing that we're doing is we're knocking out all of the gut infections that are triggering the inflammation in the first place. That's the whole point of doing the program. And they're deficient in tryptophan. But yeah, if you just gave that patient tryptophan by itself and you allowed the inflammatory process to continue, of course they would get worse. I mean, they'd because you're not really addressing what's wrong. All right, so that's a super simple version of a protocol. I would just do one more because I mentioned this, but I didn't really show you. So you have to imagine now another lab with low commensal bacteria. Low commensal bacteria, you're going to do prebiotics, you know, whatever your favorite one is, one or two of those with a meal. You're going to do some probiotics. Oh, the prebiotics, actually, I apologize. That's on an empty stomach. So that's usually going to be like here. Well, it could be either. You could do it either way. Uh, probiotics, uh, again, they could be either with or without food. And then some butyrate. Remember, that's for the microbiome. But get your butyrate from a good company. That's usually dosed maybe three times a day also, either in a pill or some companies have it in a liquid. So those are prebiotics, probiotics, and butyrate for the microbiome, if their microbiome markers were low. And then if you have a gallbladder problem, then you would do an ox bile based product. That would be for the low, for the steatocrit being off, uh, being high. If they have an enzyme related issue, elastase is off, you would use pancreatic enzymes. You don't have to do all these things. And if they had a parasitic problem, you know, you would do like a parasitic herbal support kind of thing. And then tryptophan low, you give tryptophan, quinolinic acid or kynurinic acid high. You can do anti-inflammatories, just said that, like curcumin and magnesium are required. And then you're off and running with an integrated program. That if we have a few minutes for questions, I'd be happy to do a couple of questions. Okay, well, Dr. Kalish, we do have some questions. Um, first one, what consequences do low fiber diets like keto or carnivore have in long term? I have a patient, I'll call him David. He is an American, he lives in Brazil. He only eats beef. He's still alive. He's been doing this for a couple of years. I'm mean, not making this up, he only eats beef. Um, if you want a healthy microbiome, you have to eat adequate fiber and polyphenols, period. The amount of meat you eat or don't eat is just going to depend on, you know, your activity level and your, you know, your emotional, spiritual attitude towards killing animals and all these kinds of things. But if you're under eating fiber or polyphenols, you're going to create a deficient microbiome, and that's going to cause problems with your immune system, cardiovascular system, uh, your brain, as we've been talking about. It's catastrophic. So I'm kind of neutral on meat. I have patients that don't meet, eat meat and patients that eat a lot of meat. But no matter how much meat you're eating or not eating, you have to have sufficient polyphenols and fiber in the diet, or you're going to get really screwed up. The problem that happens is that you can lose weight really quickly by cutting out fiber and carbs. And so people feel great over the short term if they go to like a high bacon, high coconut oil, high butter diet. But in the long run, you know, they're just heading off this immune slash metabolic slash, you know, heart attack cliff that they just don't see coming. Okay, next one. Why would a patient's acromancia level be high? Why would acromancia be high? Well, remember I showed those diagrams where one group of organisms is making fiber, there's a group making uh, hydrogen, there's a group consuming hydrogen. They're all interacting, and there's a lot of them, right? We've just showed a few examples. And so a single organism being high, you'd have to look at the entire complex of the microbiome to get a sense of why that's happening. 
it's it's that'd be difficult, right? It'd be difficult to track that down. All right. Um, can low hydrogen production in the gut aggravate dementia? Well, I guess that I could ask the question in reverse. Is hydrogen production in the gut good for you? Just think about that. It has to be because it's an essential component of a healthy microbiome. So adequate levels of hydrogen being produced in the gut, it's a gas. And if last time you check, if you look at like where your large intestine runs, it runs right across your chest and right underneath your heart. So that area of your large intestine that goes right underneath your heart is constantly, you know, being a repository for the hydrogen gas that these organisms are making. And gas doesn't stay there, right? The gas leaks out. So hydrogen turns out to be incredibly healing and good for you. Yes. So that, would it help with dementia? Absolutely, yes. Also cardiovascular disease prevention? Absolutely, yes. All right, next one. Is there a role of hydrogen water in maintaining a healthy microbiome? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But that's not really the point, you know, the, because you want these bacteria to grow out and proliferate and to sort themselves out properly. You don't want to try to control that or what do you call it, like hyper vigilantly kind of control it because it's a process. Remember, it's these, it's these populations of these different types of organisms that are feeding one another. All right. Um, this is my last one. How, uh, what do the hydrogen consumers eat? Is it just the byproduct of the hydrogen producers? Yes. So they're dependent. The hydrogen consumers are entirely dependent on the hydrogen producers in order to survive. It's pretty profound when you think about it. Well, Dr. Kalish, I appreciate all of your time today. Everybody have a great day. Appreciate it. Bye for now. Bye.